In total, there were 14 titles published by Black Label in 2020. Like the first year, six titles were Batman related. So at this point, literally half of the publishing output is Bat franchise dependent. It's really living up to the public perception that Black Label is actually Bat Label. Unfortunately, a Bat product doesn't automatically equal a good comic. I might even say the Batman related stuff this year was not the best. In fact, there's only a few standout titles and a whole pile of mediocre. So let's take a look at each title published during 2020 and see what we can see. Before we get to the reviews, let me shamelessly plug this channel. If you're new and you like what you see, please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. If you want to go a step further and directly support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. This channel has had a rough few months, so any and all support is greatly appreciated. As always, thank you for watching. Now on with the video. This is a typical Harley Quinn madcap romp. Other than some adult language, there's nothing in the series that requires a mature label. It is, from what I can tell, just another Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti comic starring Harley Quinn. So if you enjoyed their previous run, then, well, here's some more. Connor's artwork is pretty awesome, but beyond that, it had a very, very low entertainment value for me. Adam Strange returns to Earth with his partner, Alana, where he documents his time fighting a war on the planet Ran. The book becomes a bestseller, and Adam becomes a media sensation. However, the murder of a person who confronted Adam at a signing leads to a criminal investigation. Mr. Terrific investigates Adam to determine his guilt or innocence in this murder. This leads Mr. Terrific to uncover the truth about Adam's time on Ran. Obviously, this is a series that deserves a much deeper evaluation. It's a story told in three tiers, which, in my opinion, is based on the old adage, there are three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. There's the story Adam tells in the novel, there's the story told by the history of events Mr. Terrific uncovers, and then there's what really happened. To briefly continue the three tiers metaphor, Ran is a three-tiered society. Most pages are broken into three panels. There are three voices telling the story, the writer, Tom King, and the artists, Mitch Gerards and Doc Shaner. There are three main characters, Mr. Terrific, Adam Strange, and Alana Strange. Naturally, most fictional stories are structured in three acts. The brief look at the story elements implies much more to discover. Thematically, it may be an examination of the stories we tell to create heroes, and whether those heroes can survive that level of scrutiny. So it gently explores propaganda as a tool for a society's self-preservation. But none of that pretentious meandering answers the basic question. Is it any good? Yes, it is. Although, it does contain many of Tom King's basic situations and character traits, especially when compared to the prior series, Mr. Miracle. There is a seemingly hopeless war with a traumatized hero who makes a questionable decision involving the life of his child. The hero has a strong female partner that endures these trials beside him, but has a slightly different perspective on the events. Of course, the resolutions are different, as are the characters and their wants and needs, but the basic template does exist. That being said, it is good as a fractured but linear story. It's not something that can be breezed through in one sitting. There's a lot going on, and it continually cuts back and forth to contrast the past with the present. It does demand the reader's attention. Critically speaking, it may be a bit longer than necessary. Not that any issue feels like filler, but the story does seem to drag in places. For example, the dangerous war on Ran, contrasted with Adam and Alana's domestic boredom, is well established, perhaps a bit too often. Mr. Terrific's meticulous investigation is done well, and quite honestly, was the most engaging aspect of the story. In other words, there are parts where the story breathes a bit too much, and the pace could have been tighter. But I have to reiterate, these are preliminary thoughts. My opinion may change on a reread. Personally, I think Adam gets done dirty for the sake of the story. And quite possibly, King did this to distance this series from being compared too heavily to Mr. Miracle. That being said, if you approach Strange Adventures as a story that's not part of continuity, which I think is a very reasonable presumption, then Adam's downfall is story appropriate, if not a little forced.
drug lords are attempting to establish themselves in Gotham, and Harley Quinn, newly released from Task Force X, is being stalked and hunted by the Joker. The story moves rather quickly and the artwork is competent, so it's not a terrible read, but it's also not all that interesting. I'm reasonably certain the only reason this was a black label release is because Renee Montoya is a traitor with heroic motivations, which is a necessary plot beat that's a little outside the established mainstream character. Otherwise, if the language was toned down, it could have easily been a one-shot in the DC universe. Although the ultimate motivation for the story was clearly to be a tie-in with the movie that was released that same year. Part of me wants to suggest this was an abandoned plot for that movie. Because the Joker appears a few times, he's only seen in shadow, or he's conveniently off-panel, and he has no lines. It reads like a movie plot where they didn't have the rights to show the character in full. So they were coy and just suggested it was the Joker, instead of showing him outright. It seems like a weird choice for a comic. This is, literally, a role-playing guide for dungeon masters who might want to create a campaign using the mythology of this comic. That's all that needs to be said. A young Bruce Wayne watches a disturbing show for children and turns to murder. I'm pretty sure this is a leftover or edited out subplot from the prior series, Joker Killer Smile. Overall it's coherent, but somewhat trivial, and the story doesn't really go anywhere. At best this is supplementary material and alternate covers that don't enhance the original series. It's just filler that would show up at the end of a trade paperback. The story is presented as a mystery. Three crimes are committed simultaneously by three individuals who look like the Joker. Who the real Joker is, and what that endgame might be, is the focus of the story. Basically, it's learned that Joker is trying to create a better Joker, which is a meaningless reveal that goes exactly nowhere. I did a review of the series when it was released in 2020, and my objection to the material still stands. To a degree, it's softened by the possibility that this likely isn't canon. It's an unnecessary sequel to Alan Moore's Killing Joke, which didn't need further elaboration. All the ambiguities or interpretations in the original story are what made the Killing Joke work. Filling them in grounds the story to one mundane possibility that doesn't add to the source material. Really, it's the writer, Jeff Johns, filling in the mysteries for no good reason. Honestly, if it was a story that didn't try so hard to be a Killing Joke sequel, I might not be as critical as I have been because objectively, it's not terrible or incompetent. But looking at it in the context of it being a sequel, or at least, a piece of work that heavily evokes the killing joke, it's just a bad copy that doesn't carry the weight of the original. John Constantine investigates a series of murders that have a connection to his childhood misadventures. This is a rather light-hearted, vertigo-adjacent series, Technically it's horror, but it lacks the serious edge of the original Hellblazer series, and Constantine is a mere shadow of his former self. Originally, John Constantine was a manipulator who had no friends and used people to prevent whatever evil might be plaguing him, and he bore the mental consequences of those actions. He was not a good man. He was barely tolerated by anyone who knew him. Anyone who did help Constantine did it under duress, or because of a duty to stop evil, or due to ignorance of what they were getting involved with. Constantine exploits people's ignorance, or the contempt they have for him. Really, that's a fundamental part of the character. In Rise and Fall, the supporting cast are quite willing to help him without any coercion whatsoever. Even Lucifer, yes, Lucifer, the ruler of hell, and the king of all the demons Constantine regularly defeats, is quite happy to help. Also, for no good reason, Constantine is suddenly gay or bisexual, it's not specified which, and he makes out with Lucifer. From my memory, as someone who has read nearly the entire 300 issue run, he was very clearly straight. But for the sake of argument, let's say his sexuality is flexible. After all, it could make character sense if he's willing to do anything to achieve his goals. What he most certainly wouldn't do is make out with a demon, especially the king of demons. That's not a bragging point for him. In fact, it would be contradicting every principle he follows. He may have worked with demons and questionable individuals, but again, they were a means to an end. 
and those demons and bad people usually got their comeuppance at some point. So to get intimate with someone who literally personifies everything he's spent his life fighting, well, that breaks the story. Not to mention, his sexuality has no bearing on the story itself. It's a character beat that seems a little capricious. Putting that aside, the story is just fine. It's not great, but it's not incompetent. Derek Robertson's art is pretty darn good, and rather appropriate for the character. It's a shame he hasn't had a chance to illustrate Hellblazer before now. I do believe the original series was still being published when this one-shot came out. This is a side story that takes place before the events of the original miniseries. If you like that, you'll like this. The original team of the Vertigo series returned to give this title an apocalyptic conclusion. This is not a series for anyone unfamiliar with American Vampire. It relies on its own continuity and mythology. While there is room for more stories, it acts as an overall conclusion to the saga started by Scott Snyder. Notably, it brings Skinner Sweet's story to an end. Sweet was, arguably, the protagonist of the series, even though he wasn't in every story. However, his creation began the unique American Vampire bloodline. As an ending, it works, but it's more than a little forced. It also seems somewhat rushed in places, as some scenes suddenly transition without explanation. And some of the action is a bit over the top. But its intent was to be a thrill ride that finishes the series off, which it accomplishes. Honestly, the original series seemed to be a lot more grounded and character-oriented. This finale is an action movie with vampires and various demonic beings, so it's boiled down to the basics and kind of surface level. Personally, it made me feel ambivalent. This is another Tom King work that needs more than a surface level examination. So consider this my initial preliminary thoughts. The story begins with the death of a Rorschach character and then works backwards to fill in the details of how this person became Rorschach and why he took the actions he did. We also learn about the backstory of his accomplice, the kid, a woman with a deeply troubled past. One of the most compelling elements, because it happens unexpectedly, is a metatextual look at the comic book creators Steve Ditko, Otto Binder, and Frank Miller. At least, Watchmen Universe versions of these real people. The common element between these three people is they became hardcore in their beliefs at some point in their life. Ditko is well known for being a staunch objectivist. Binder believed aliens were at least partially responsible for life on Earth. And Miller, well, he seems to have become very reactionary. This series is firmly grounded in the Watchmen continuity, and it contains elements of the HBO Watchmen series. It takes place in modern times, decades after the squid attack in New York that ended the original Watchmen series. However, the repercussions of that event still resonate. The threat of another squid attack permeates the culture in various subtle ways. For some, like the kid, they've grown up with this threat hanging over their head. They don't know about a world where a squid attack wasn't an imminent possibility. So the unintended consequences of Adrian Veidt's plan was swapping the fear of atomic annihilation with the fear of an alien invasion. I would say the overall subtext is one concerning how some beliefs can connect to other adjacent beliefs until they all combine into one conspiracy theory type of situation, and how some people are predisposed, due to their experiences, to adopt radical points of view, then act on them to create a better world. You could compare it to Veidt's singular conspiracy to create a utopia with a shared worldwide threat, to the smaller squid-related conspiracy that seems equally threatening and apocalyptic to an individual. The only difference is scale. This may not appeal to many people, but I find it an interesting piece of work. King may be stretching his abilities a bit, but I think he's reasonably successful. Worth a mention is the artwork by Jorge Fornes. It just works for the material, and it gave me a Gotham Central vibe. It's just so expressive and clean, while also feeling gritty. The coloring by Dave Stewart is stupidly good. I'm always amazed at how much he influences atmosphere with what looks like a simple color palette. It makes me sick how he effortlessly enhances a scene with limited but very appropriate color choices. Seriously, Stewart has perfect sensibilities for tone and subtlety. This is an odd sequel, mainly because the original series came to a definitive conclusion. The story takes place 300 years after the original. At this point, mankind lives underground in caves to avoid the killer virus. 
Through experimentation, they managed to create a visual and biological copy of the former main character, Gus. This copy's entire purpose is to be released to the surface and infect the hybrid population with the new virus. If I had to guess, the only reason this miniseries exists is to potentially cash in on the Netflix adaptation. Because it's kind of pointless. It has a drawn-out, convoluted premise that doesn't really go anywhere. It plays heavily on nostalgia by hitting classic beats from the original story. But that's all it is. It's a greatest hits type of story with a slight twist. Unfortunately, this is not a comic book. It's a novel with illustrations. Overall, it looks at the history of different people of color and their place within the ongoing continuity of events taking place in the DC Universe. Honestly, because of the format, I cannot review this as a comic book, because it isn't one. So this is a non-review, I guess you could say. It's a piece that I may circle back to at a future date, because it does look interesting. I have to wonder if the inspiration for this series was a response to the outrage at the Batman and Catwoman marriage fakeout done in the regular series. Anyway, this is a very fractured look at the relationship between Batman and Catwoman and the people behind the masks, Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle. It also involves the presence of the Joker, who attempts to influence Selina to follow her criminal instincts. While I am a fan of brevity and not hammering home plot beats, sometimes the hopping around in time was a touch too fractured and confusing. This is definitely a piece that could have been well served by a consistent visual narrative with different artists, like Strange Adventures. While there are visual cues, notably Catwoman's costume, there are some times she isn't in costume and it's not immediately obvious when the event is taking place. This is not a critique of the art, which is well done by Clay Mann, but a critique of the narrative form. King is clearly experimenting, and visually, it's not as smooth as intended. Different visual styles would have made the narrative very cohesive. But unless you have a J.H. Williams, who can seemingly change his style on a whim, that's going to be a pretty difficult task for any artist. So this is King playing with the form and structure of a comic, which comes off as a method to disguise a story that is, essentially, a character examination, rather than a piece with a lot of subtext and interpretation. After all, the story is rather straightforward, but the jumbled events, arranged to fit issue-specific themes, give the appearance of complexity. Put another way, the structure is the star of the piece, not the characters. Still, it's a solid piece about a strong female protagonist. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love how it was structured. Your mileage may vary. For the purposes of ranking, I do have to exclude some work. The other history of the DC Universe will be excluded because it's a novel. The Criminal Sanity Sourcebook is just bonus material, as is the two Last God comics. So I'm removing those three from the ranking. In last place is Smile Killer. It's just a story that didn't need to be told. Following that is Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey, with Birds of Prey slightly above it mainly because it was only one issue and didn't drag out the story. In the number 7 spot is Hellblazer, Rise and Fall. It's not anything that resembles the original series, and I would not suggest it to Hellblazer fans. It would be a few places down the list if it didn't have great Derek Robertson artwork. Sweet Tooth The Return is next because it was, again, an unnecessary story. It might be good for those who miss the regular series, and it does have Jeff Lemire art, so it's not a complete waste of time. American Vampire, 1976, is in the same vein, no pun intended. It's good for anyone who wanted to see the series wrapped up in an all-out action adventure. At number 4 is Three Jokers. As much as I object to it connecting itself to the killing joke, I can appreciate that Jeff Johns is trying to write a coherent, more mature story, which he does mostly successfully. And the artist, Jason Fabok, needs some recognition for putting in some very solid work. In my heart, I would place this around number 9 but critically, it's right where it needs to be at number 4. Obviously, the top three belong to the work of Tom King. The weakest piece, Batman Catwoman, gets the third spot. I think the fractured structure was a clever device that didn't help the straightforward story. It was a difficult choice between number 1 and number 2. Strange Adventures was excellently put together, and I thought Mr. Terrific was well written. The two different art styles were also a perfect choice. 
However, at the end, Adam's understandable heel turn and Alana's somewhat over-the-top defiance leads to a fatal accident that was a bit forced. So, due to this, Strange Adventures is the second place choice. That leaves Rorschach. As a complete package, it's very well done. And until the moment it came to justify which comic would take the top spot, I actually thought this would be number two. Its vague sequel status actually hurt it, in my opinion. Just on principle alone, it's something I should dislike. But unlike other Watchmen sequels, it went in a unique direction and didn't rely on Watchmen nostalgia as a selling point. And personally, I find myself much more intrigued by the material and find a lot more to discuss. Overall, the top three choices are worth a read, although it's a soft recommendation for Batman Catwoman. The three briefly revived Vertigo titles are only good for those that miss those titles. Even then, they pale in comparison to the originals. Everything else is not worthwhile. An ongoing best of Black Label list with the 2019 and 2020 titles added together would look like this. Some might note I did swap Wonder Woman Dead Earth with Batman Last Night on Earth. In retrospect, I think Dead Earth deserves to be closer to the top than Last Night. So overall, in this revised edition, it lands at number 3. Once again, thank you for watching, and thanks to all the fine people who support this channel. As stated at the beginning, there's now a Patreon page where you can directly help this channel. It's been a rough few months, so any and all support is greatly appreciated. Extra special thanks go to Mark Antoine Martinetti, Johnny Lim, Aaron Segman, Steve White, Taylor Dull, Zach Kleinfelter, and Matt Marino. They are all justified and ancient. Thank you one and all.